Hi guys, welcome to the Sling Den. Today I've got the 11th episode for you. As far as making goes, this is pretty much me. This table, band sets, that's as far as my talents get me. But let's face it, in this hobby, we've got some fantastic makers, and today I've got one of the best in the world. A lot of people have asked me to get this guy on, and I have delivered. He's a talented young man from the UK, and that is none other than John Jeffries. How are you doing, my friend? Very good, mate. Very good. Yourself? Yeah, I'm good. I'm uh, really, really excited to have you on. I was just saying in the uh, introduction there, I've had a few people ask for you to come on, and I said, I finally got you on. It's... Uh, I'm really excited for it. Really excited. I got a lot of stuff to go through, um, yeah, as well as a lot yeah. of questions from the uh, community. So, I suppose we should get started and uh, just uh, giving you the mic and letting you introduce yourself. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sweet. As I'm. Yeah. Well, I'm John Jeffries. Uh, I well, I set up the small business John Jeffries Custom Catapults. Uh, was a hobby. Now it's say as a main part of my sort of income. Um, yeah, been making catapults maybe eight years now, something like eight, eight, nine years. Um, yeah, and it's just gone from strength to strength. Models, designs, gone from, you know, the basic ash fork cut from a tree to, you know, working with some of the coolest materials I can think of. Uh, yeah, so yeah, that, that's, that's me. So I'm assuming, you know, being a maker, you first started by shooting. So give us a quick rundown yeah. on um, how you started shooting, why you started shooting, and how long you've actually been shooting. Uh, I'd probably say at least 10 years. Uh, obviously, I, as everyone, it's the standard, you know, as a kid, everyone had a, a Black Widow, big wrist rocket, you know, if you could hit a tree, you're all right. Um, but yeah, I went from there. Uh, what was it? Yeah, I'd say, yeah, 10 years ago, you know, a couple of the boys are out. I said, right, do you want to come out, you know, on the weekend? Uh, one of my mates has got a catapult. All right, sweet, give it a go. Went out there, you know, wherever we could find some nice stones or if someone was lucky enough to have some ball bearings, you know, that they got from a farmer's when they're changing their bearings over. Took them out. Um, yeah, I, it's just part of me. My personality, I can't ever have a, just have a go at something and leave it there. <laughs> so it, it just got to the point where, yeah, I was just like, this is quite good, you know, I was, Obviously, I couldn't hit a barn door the first, first, few, first few times we went out. Um, but, yeah, then I eventually sort of, you know, God, have I just hit the same tree twice? Or, you know, <laughs> we, we'd have, near me there's a couple of Calagas cans, you know, just obviously someone's dumped, and they were a good target because obviously the noise is like a giant tin can. Um, then, yeah, it was, it was just that intrinsic sort of, like, reward from hitting something with something else. Just like I say, short-range shooting sports I've always loved. And, yeah, then started going online, you know, YouTube, uh, went on Facebook, typed in catapult, and I uh, realized there was already groups set up. Uh, and yeah, I think it was probably say a year or two after that. A good friend of mine, Nathan Young, we went to school together, and I found him on one of the catapult pages as well. Um, then yeah, we sort of went right. There's a there's a competition in Newport, it's only about two hours from me, so we, uh, we got some practice in best we could. And, went along and that's when the addiction really kicked in so when you're meeting people from all up and down the country and you start going like seeing handmade catapults you know people that have got different bits and pieces from all over the world and yeah that's just sort of that's where i really sort of gripped hold of it and never let go and what was it that made you decide to make your own was it a case of you were you know you were shooting and you were trying out these frames and you thought you know what i'm, I'm gonna give this a go um uh, you know, and I'm going to make it my own, or was it just? Were you, did you always have this kind of creative mindset of making things? What what, what was it? Um, there wasn't a real. I don't think there was ever a need. I thought you know, like, oh, I need something different, or you know, I, I want something else. It was. I had plenty of, as everyone does. You know, is you buy one, you think oh, that's really good, like this one, but I prefer something smaller. And you go to a completely different frame. Like I say, I, I used to bounce between like a, a miniature SPS and a PPMG, completely different ends of the, like the table. Um, and then uh, I think it was, yeah, just started looking at other custom builders out there. There was, I say, there's plenty in the estates at the time. Um, they also seen like G10, Makata, like all this sort of stuff being used. And I thought, that's quite cool. You know, I, can just, I can buy that online. Um, 
obviously started making a couple of plywood builds um and then i think it was i've been making a few you know i used to do a lot of uh, milbro scaled builds or you know the natural you know the antler buffalo horn all the sort of traditional sort of type of materials but um yeah it's when i, I think i got an off cut from a friend of a bit of like a sheet of micarta uh, started having a play around with that and then yeah so I put a pen to paper. I've always liked art and creating things. I'm, I've always been quite good at looking at, you know, anything, for example. You know, I'm quite good at sort of breaking it down my own sort of steps, how I would go around making that. So I picked up a lot of help along the lines, i say, from Asa Wilson, Paul Cheetah and stuff like that. And, yeah, it got to the point where I was like, you know, I've, I found a couple of bits of, you know, a few templates I've drawn out on, on paperwork and, yeah, the sort of the mustang shape come out uh, that was the flagship that's my flagship model that was i think i made the first one in 2017 uh with well, it, well i was thinking about making that for the world cup because that's the that was the first slingshot world cup so yeah i had the the mustang i think i had a solid hole the hunter's course there went there and i thought well yeah this this just works i absolutely love it you know I had a little play around luckily obviously being my own i could go home shape it you know change little bits polish it up and then yeah the, the mustang sort of come from there and that's and then it sort of goes hand in hand with a lot of people sort of go oh what are you shooting there oh it's this 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 mustang oh cool where, where do you get that oh, i made it and then he goes oh how much is it i don't know <laughs> i just made it and you know and people say well, okay well let me know and i'll uh, i'll buy one that's brilliant i think you know I wish we could all do that and you make it sound really, really simple, <laughs> but I know that's not the case. So did you study in, you know, anything in terms of design? Um, because, you know, from what you say, you know, making it your own and all that great stuff. Again, I think we wish we can all do that, but how did you find your way in being able to do something so intricate? Um, I think it was having so many catapults beforehand. A lot of them, a lot of, well, when I first started, a lot of custom catapults were just a core with, you know, a material on either side. So a lot of them were very flat. Uh, then Lewis Pride started making a lot of his target frames with all the, you know, large palm swells, a lot more sort of ergonomic. Um, and then just looking, just looking at my hand, the way I held things, that's where I could adapt. That's why I like the offset handle. Just so if I can, you know, if it's on camera, as I fold my fingers in that way, they... I've always I noticed they sit offset anyway. So that's what I thought, right, you know, I've shot an SPS for years, not completely symmetrical, but why don't I just kick the handle off and then say that's where I've got a basic offset Y shape. Then I've always I always held my catapults almost too high. So that's where I put the a nice little recurve at the top so I could sit the forks and the recurve would just lay over the top of my middle finger. And it was just playing around with a couple of layers of um, a car to glue together and just keep shaping it and shaping it and just keep holding it holding it and then just going off the sort of um well yeah just shaped it pretty much to what i felt comfortable and what i wanted out of a build and then yeah ended up with a the mustang in form and then yeah just obviously just started to refine it a little bit more now for those who um don't know you know when we talk about sort of custom what what is the idea behind the custom catapult? Because obviously, you know, there's a number of frames out there which are made in big batches, you know, and they're still fantastic frames. But what makes a custom unique? Um, well, every custom build I do make completely by hand. So you've got the handmade aspect of, you know, it will never be exactly the same. But I've always found, again, there's, I'll throw the word out, the intrinsic sort of feeling of, you know, if you've had something made to you, you're... It's like the pride sort of thing. If you get, you know, if you had a car custom spec to you, you're going to be more, you know, you'd be happier driving that. Probably drive it better than you would a car that was just standard, maybe. Mm -hmm. So you've got that side of things, and then yeah, every every, every catapult, out of fork gap, tip size, and handle length is completely bespoke. I, obviously, I have a, I have a stock range of catapults, my standard sizes, but yeah, any custom dimensions, um, completely tailored. I, I think as I think I've made a Mustang that was 115 millimeters wide. Which was massive. Oh, that was I could. Oh, I think I could almost fit a pickle fork inside the fork gaps on that one. And then yeah, I think I'll, yeah, I'll the skinniest uh, Mustang I've made yeah is the is the eight, uh, Mustang PFS at sixty millimeters wide. So 
the tolerances are, are so are massive in that. And and how does that work? Do, do people just get on to you and say, "Look, I'm looking for this. Um, you know, I want my fork with as this. You know, I want." Uh, does that work with colors as well? They want certain colors and certain designs put in, and then you know, it's your job to source these materials and make it. Yeah, that's what, yeah, it's exactly it. People, you know, so people reach out, they love the look of the Mustang, or you know, they've had a go on a friend's one, or they just they really want to invest in a custom build. So that's where they they come to me with their like, with their specific needs with from the build. And probably my most, well, the most cool part about it is when someone goes, you know, here's a picture of my dog, or here's my truck, you know, or here's a here's a photo I took last year when I was out, and I love the colours. Can you mix this into a build? And that's where I get the complete artistic freedom to know, you know, I'll lay out two or three different options, maybe with uh, with a, with the materials laid out, and the people can pick and choose. You know, like getting accents from the pins. It's they are they, they can be very simple or they can be really really loud and garish but you know each one is completely different down to like a difference in line a difference in pin material and that's that is really what i do like about you know the best i like working with anyone but i find it the best when someone goes right here's a picture so you know i've done a few for dogs so they go here's my dog i don't want to see it till it arrives end of sort of they just say let me know a price and that that is like music to my ears every time because i can really sit there you know and they're like there's no rush you know i, I don't take months anyway to make a catapult you know it's like it gives you a bit of like, breathing space you can sit there i can look at the photo one day and then look at it another day and i might see a slightly different art i've got a bit of material there or i saw a bit of material online that i could buy, buy in to then use and this is oh, that's that's really is my favorite part about it it's completely completely fluid there when it comes to the custom side of things i think to be honest if if, if i got one from you i'd be too worried about getting a four kit on it or <laughs> you know just damaging it because you know like you said it is a piece of piece of art and you know how does it feel for you letting these things go because obviously you put a lot of work and a lot of effort into it um and then you've got this thing and you send it away obviously i imagine the feedback from your customers is probably the best feeling ever um, yeah. And we quickly spoke just before we started this about, um, you know, the amount of questions we've got in from people and having your name known out there. How, how does that make you feel? Oh, it's, it's, it's incredible. It really is, I say, especially with the custom side of things, you know, when you say, oh, this is, I've had a few like, um, mem memorial pieces as well where people have had a catapult made in memory of someone or something. Um, and, I, and they say to me, you know, this is an heirloom. This won't ever leave me. I think straight away, you know, that's, that's, I, from what I can make in my workshop is now leaving a mark on someone forever. You know, it's so unique to them that it, even if they sold it, it would never, it would just never be right. So I, I love that side of things. You say when some, even down to the point where someone goes, you know, it's turned up, it's absolutely lovely, can't wait to get it banded. Again, it is, it's just like a complete reinforcement of like just so much thanks. And it's, mm -hmm. That's that's what I love. So I, sort of, I live by the uh, sort of mantra of you know make someone smile in a day and you know it's worth waking up for you know if you can make a change to someone's day even in the slightest you know it, it's, it's you're doing something right in life if you if i can do some, that with something as simple as a slingshot or a catapult and you see how i'm absolutely made up i absolutely love that side of things and i think you know one thing about our community um for the most part and also a lot of makers and things like that because it is a niche hobby i think it is all about that fine attention to detail and actually putting a smile on people's faces you know you never see anyone really going to kind of get rich from making catapults you know yeah. um you know and when we're talking like price points and stuff i i truly believe in i believe in you what you pay for is what you get um you know and we look at different materials and things like that um, and i was actually speaking to a friend of mine ethan martin of uh, tennessee slang and he was saying that he makes a few and he was saying that carbon fiber gl glow in the dark stuff um, i think he looked it was something like four by four inches don't quote me on that but it was something like 75 dollars yeah. um you know and yeah, that stuff like, oh, i love that glow carbon but okay, so that's creeping up to some be some of my higher end builds because i think for me I, i'd normally have to buy a six by six inch sheet uh, about i think it's what six mil roughly thick and I think with postage and import on top, so a sheet of that works out about 150 quid. So, you know, a core alone might be 
70 quid you know mm. already that's like you know that could be an entry level custom build at 70 pounds alone but that's just the core that's without you know 12 14 15 hours of work involved and then the rest of the materials around it the packaging the postage <laughs> Yeah, it, it soon creeps up. The materials out there are amazing, but yeah, sometimes you really have, do have to pay through the nose for them. Um, what, what is it like working with these materials? Do you find that some are better than others? Yeah. Depending yeah. on where you're sourcing them? is Because obviously, you know, I imagine, you know, not only have you got to have something that, you know, feels good in the hand, is really durable, but you've also got to have something that you're able to craft, um, yeah. you know, yeah. with a bit of ease. Yeah, with, oh, without a doubt. It's, yeah, it's... The more you money you can spend on materials, it normally well, ninety five percent of the time it pays off because you know you, the the company, especially if you buy from a standalone company like the Glow Carbons, or you go direct to a supplier for G tens or Macarters, you know if that's all they sell, it must be pretty good. So yeah, it's a the more you spend, normally the better quality you get because there are a lot of people that do sort of make their own. But you know when you go to a company that's invested hundreds of thousands of pounds into material making machines and you know, pressure tanks that have got ridiculous amounts of pressure and to get these materials as flat and void free, you know, it's perfect. And it's, again, it's the longevity of a frame. I would, I'm happy and confident, I know, say if I had a solid carbon fiber build, that would, if someone dropped it, you know, it was in a field, that would be exactly the same for the next few hundred years, you know, possibly, obviously until the epoxy actually starts to break down. But, you know, it's spending money on decent materials, you know, it's the... I don't want to make a. I don't ever want to make a catapult with like a sell by or a use by date almost. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so the, yeah, materials out there are a lot of the time they are very expensive, but say it does pay off eventually. You know, you've, you've got no chance of a delamination, and, and the look of the fit and the finish of the material always does pay off that way. And where where would you say um, you, you sell? The majority of your catapults i know obviously you know we mentioned you're a big name so i imagine a lot of people actually just come to you directly it's not a case of you have to advertise yeah. and all that sort of stuff um do you find that is the biggest way i know yeah um you know you go to game fairs and stuff we're going to touch on that in a minute um, i know you've been a bit busy so um just give us a rundown on that and you know what it's like when you get people get in contact with you um well, i'd say at the moment, it's probably 65% of my work is going to America. A lot goes stateside. Um, but it's, it fluctuates. It, it's quite strange to me. I thought, you know, normally business fluctuates, but actually location does as well. Sometimes I won't have an order from the UK for weeks, and then all of a sudden it will switch completely from going stateside to, you know, a lot from the UK. It's, it's, it's weird. It's weird. It, trying to find a, like a trend in the actual sort of pattern of purchases or you know where where sales to is it's it's been nearly impossible so i think oh all right i'm near, i'm seeing a bit of a pattern here then no <laughs> it stops so uh, you know we, we've seen you at game fairs and things like that as well how how do you get on at them because I, i've been to a couple myself um and i love them and for those who don't know i know there's a lot of people in the states that watch this a game fair is you're kind of all in one place for um shooting and hunting um just field sports in general um yeah, stuff for gun dogs yeah, the show and displays. Yeah. um and it, it was the first time actually i'd just gone that i'd seen a, a store selling catapults and i was really surprised because it kind of just caught me at a glance i was like oh my god um you know there's, there's a stall here um what's it like for you do you get many people kind of surprised that you're there yeah, that I I think that is my favourite part about the game fair. As I say, normally I do the shooting, British shooting show and the game fair, uh, both with Emily workshops. I've started doing a few small um, sort of bushcraft events, which are quite cool. They're very focused, so you know everyone's guaranteed to be, guaranteed to be outdoorsy. Um, but I, that's what I absolutely love it. Again, it's, it's that surprise. People walk past and go, custom catapults. Like, oh, I haven't had one of them in years. And then they come over, you know, like, oh, you know, what's that one you call, you know, the big wrist strap? And sometimes you can be sitting there for, chatting for 40 minutes to someone that's, you know, absolutely had no idea about, you know, catapults other than a black widow and shooting stones. And then the next thing, you know, they leave, you know, everything from the World Cup to competitions and all the materials possible possible to be used now. And it, it's amazing chatting to these people, you know, because they it's gone from... They turned up that day with like zero knowledge of the catapult world 
then like here's a encyclopedia of like, well the whole subject condensed down into a half an hour contract like like conversation like they'll just go <laughs> so yeah, you know obviously like, you're a very busy man and i imagine you know making and all these sort of things take up a lot of your time yeah. um how, how many opportunities did you get to shoot um because i know you've just been to the international and european championships and we're going to touch on that but how often do you get to go out and just enjoy shooting yourself um it's not as much as i'd like to i'd definitely say that um especially if, I, if i'm doing a long if i've got a show to coming up or i've got a few orders on the bench i just don't really take time off i, I just get a bit weird you know sec second someone's paid me i don't, I don't really want to think oh, i'm swatting off and i'm not working on their order i feel like i'm you know doing something wrong so and especially as i say if i'm doing a long day if i've done say like seven till seven in the workshop and I've been sanding catapults all day and machining catapults. I don't then think, you know what, I can't wait to pick another catapult <laughs> up. <laughs> but yeah, some days, you know, especially like we've had really bad weather for the last couple of weekends and well, weeks. And today's been nice. So I thought, you know what, I'll dip the magnet in the in the bottom of the catch box, whatever comes out, I love them. And it's just, it's just lovely to break it up, you know, just take 20 minutes out to sort of just recenter and just enjoy what doing what say what started this off for me and usually when i put you know um a post up there for people to ask some questions i usually get what's the favorite setup but no one's asked that um a lot of the questions are focused around you making but um i just want to kind of emphasize how you know you are a great shot as well um so <laughs> i want to know um <laughs> what, what's your go-to setup what do you like shooting you probably haven't had anyone ask because I haven't changed in like five <laughs> years now. It's 0.55 white BSB, 155 mil active, and eight mil steels. Cut a 2015 nice. taper. And you just refuse to change because it does the yeah, trick, I'm, and there's no reason just, to change. It works. There's so many cool bands out, especially like the new sniper sling in OD green. OD green is my favourite colour in the world, but. Do I want to change a setup that's worked for me for so long for the sake of a colour? So yeah, it's just it's it's just old school, and it? it's just you know if it hasn't failed, why change? And let's just talk quickly competitions because it's something I'm yet to go to. Um, I know in my mind, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, it seems to be a bit of a difference when it comes down to these meets and then sort of international and European championships. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I see these kind of hunter courses and they look brilliant, you know, um, I, and I, I'm desperate to kind of get out and do one. But then when I watch the World Championships, I think it's the closest thing we've got to sort of the Olympics. Oh, for sure. Um, you know, obviously you've been to both. Just give us a quick rundown on, one, what it's like to be at those championships uh, and, two, the differences between, your, you know, your, your meet and then those championships. Uh, I think it makes it so attractive the fact that we do have a blend of both where some some, some countries like spain all they have is indoor events uh, i know china is very much the same um going it, it's a completely different vibe you know it's, the indoor ones i find a bit more of an endurance exercise than anything because especially with the world cup the, you might shoot 10 rounds throughout the day with like a half an hour to 40 minute break between you know, it's, it's too short to go and have a sit down lunch or whatever. You know, you're just sort of floating around, you're waiting, you know, you're having a chat. Like, you know, you're trying to keep hydrated, keep awake. It's, but then you go to the, the outdoor hunter style courses, like the field target events, which are by far my favorite because it's like a weekend camping with a few of your mates. Indoor, I love it. Again, outdoor, I love it because they're so different. They're not, it's not like they're too similar to decide between. You know, they're completely different games, but. Yeah, the, uh, the field target events are, are awesome because, again, it's, it's like you just, you know, you text three or four of your mates in, in your group and you go, going, right, do you want to go up the woods this weekend? And you walk around the countryside, which is normally in a really nice setting, like Darren's got the, uh, the, the set up in Yorkshire and Harrogate. That's that's incredible. You know, lovely backdrop and you're just shooting all day, all day long and you get back, you can cook up a bit of food and, you, you know, you're, you're in a nice setting around, surrounded by people that genuinely want to be there as well. So I might, you know, from what you've just said, I imagine the mentality between the two are completely different as well. Because 
um, as you said, you know, you're with your friends, your shooting is outdoors, is a bit more relaxed. And I imagine these indoor championships, um, not only is it the breaks in between shooting and there's a long old day, and like you said, you've got to bear in mind things like keeping hydrated and keeping your focus and things like that. You know, what's it like? What sort of mentality do you have to have to be shooting in the World Championships? Yeah, I'll make it sound like, you know, it is a really hardcore event. They are still obviously incredible, especially in Italy, you know, for, well, for one, you're in Italy, so you know you're not going too far wrong. But um, yeah, it, it's 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 brilliant. The like, the vibe, just you've always got something to do. There's always someone you haven't met there, or you've you know you haven't seen them for. Well, especially for the World Cup, the just gone past. We um, say, so, yeah, oh, I I've always bumping into people I hadn't seen since the last one. So you know, you've had a four or five year break. Um, yeah, it's it is it's amazing. It's the the atmosphere is incredible and. With the indoor event, especially with uh, the the event in Italy, they get a lot of local support as well. So you've got local companies coming in. They get they get a lot of funding from the actual like, the, the mayor stuff like that. That's that's why they can afford to get the the quantity of people there. For I think it was fifty euros for three days shooting in like the the best venue I've been in. Exactly the same place as the first time we went out there. It's it's amazing. It really, really is incredible. And competition wise, what's the difference? What 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 is your aim when you're on these courses compared to the championships? Um, you've got a lot more pressure, I find, with the indoor events because especially when you put you're in a stadium and sort of behind you, you've got up to two hundred and fifty people sat there and. I I notice it more this time around in Italy. I'm, I was probably the slower shooter out of my group. Of, I think it was eight. And you know, when you've got two ball bearings left, and everyone else has stopped, and you can literally hear a pin drop, and it's just you just don't want to look round. You, you know, you've got you've got one or two targets left, and you just sat there like, I need this. <laughs> I really need these ones. <laughs> uh, but then the, the outdoor event, you know, there's always noise. There's always something going on. It's but then again, you've got the pressure of there's a lot of people there, and you know, like you've got three shots on a target. You know, you, you know, you've got more chance of hitting it. But if you don't, it's either a three points or a zero. So it's, again, it's, you've got a really easy chance. Like one target can cost you a win, or can cost you three or four places, even if, it, if it's really tightly ranked. But yeah, the, the the pressure's there on both certainly, but it's just different kinds of pressure. If, if you sort of get what I mean. Mm -hmm. and, and how well did you do and did it meet your expectations of what you were kind of going out there to do uh i think i placed it was 13th overall which is kind of weird because that's exactly what i placed the first time around as well um yeah i, I was anything close to that i said beforehand I, I would have been absolutely over the moon with and yeah i managed to get 13th again so yeah i was so happy really really happy with my shooting it's so with everything else going on it was just Forms, I was like, I would have loved to do them better, but yeah, I'm I'm happy with that. It was really good. And what frame did you shoot with? The old trusty, the uh, full <laughs> carbon, uh, the mini Mustang. That one. Yeah, she's a. That's been my go-to since I made that one. It's every sort of year or two. I'd normally make myself something new, but I don't see me changing from that. Well, not that size anyway. I think if I do make myself, it would be something exactly the same. How long have you had that one? uh that'll be two years now i think two and a bit okay yeah it's uh yeah it's my my old faith for it's simple but yeah it's uh i absolutely love it now let's let's talk about the uk because i've had i've had a number of guests on um i've had a, quite a few from the states and we know what the scene's like over there at the moment um how do you feel about the uk at the moment um as a catapult kind of community um, from what I've seen, uh, when I say I'm fairly new, I'm probably sort of two and a half, three years in. Yeah. Um, and I just feel like we're going from stride to stride to stride. Um, you know, and I was speaking to Chuck and Steele, one of the guys from the States, and I said, it feels like almost reception I get is that even though we're a much, much smaller country, it's almost like we've got the same amount of shooters. Um, yeah. I mean, I, you know, we, we go on all these pages and the amount of meets that there are, um, it doesn't matter what corner of the UK you're from. It seems like every couple of months someone's doing something. Um, you know, what about you? What have you seen? Because obviously you've been in this game a lot longer than I have. Um, have you seen it grow? And if so, what, what are the biggest differences over the late years? 
it's it's almost it evolved and then we almost got hit by a meteorite and then it's just knocked us back well i wouldn't say back it just knocked us in a completely different course because it, it gone from i think maybe 30 people meeting up at newport shooting indoors you know like a, in a community hall to just before covid we had cheltenham massive international event you know we had hundreds of people from all around the world you know china france belgium everywhere massive and then obviously lockdowns happened you know indoor sports were restricted and after that it just it dissipated there was there was so much like want for the indoor there was so much drive for it and then yeah just after i think everyone realized you know it, oh, i just want to go up the woods now or they fell back in well we were always running this that was i think it was the bca at the time we were running the uh solid hole the hunters course we had that one they would have an indoor competition throughout the winter so that was always there but then yeah it ramped up a little bit we were, so we were getting a lot more sponsorship and that was part of the the esf the england slingshot federation um but yeah it's almost when people got their freedom back to go out and about it's just that the hunters courses took over um people were realizing you know i don't i, I don't have to wait for these events you know i can i can set one up if i've you know if you've got two acres of land you can set up a hunters course and invite people up so it's making it a lot more easier for people to get you know all, all, all the way down the country to make their own smaller meats and uh yeah now there's there's loads and it's it's yeah I, I wouldn't yeah it's it ramped up massively to indoor and it was very almost replicating what we'd experienced at the world cup in italy in 2018 then it sort of changed and went back to real, almost like real roots you know our, you know field target events you know the camping the cooking everyone sort of stuck to that and it's the outdoor events have just gone from strength to strength that way where i think they're, they're making a slow it will take a while to get back to what it was for the indoor events but it's it's definitely there and, and what about catapults themselves what have you seen a change in years in how they're made um you know the designs of them themselves obviously being a maker yourself i imagine you've got a little bit of knowledge behind you on what you feel the differences are um do you find there's a lot more makers than it was say maybe five years ago oh yeah definitely yeah there's, there's been a massive sort of influx in makers i'd say that everyone that can well I say anyone that can cut a fork from a tree or buy a sheet of material can have a go at making that's it's it's really cool to see especially when someone brings something different to the table it's amazing you know, someone's just different layer in or a different found a different material or found a different grip or a different style it's just it's, it's amazing you know when anything really it's just it's really cool to see it's every day it's evolving um yeah i've seen plenty of makers come and go so there's some of sort of survived the test of time uh some have sort of you know had a go and given up so, so i think but that's the difference between sort of hobbyists and then someone wanting to make a bit more of a career out of it so yeah it's uh it's this it's, it's changed a lot so it used to be a lot more custom built again as, as i said earlier we're a lot more metal cores with a material either side or your traditional sort of dead short mill bros or sort of templates with a with a scale material uh, now it's got to a lot more modern materials a lot more ergonomic i've found you know and everything's got a bit smaller i've found any sort of design that has been around a lot a while there's always a miniature version of it <laughs> and you know I think we've got freedom in every aspect of shooting um, and you know, and that, and that tails right down from the makers being able to have the freedom to create something their own or whether, like you said, you want to go and uh, cut down a tree fork um, and design something yourself, as well as, you know, shooting, being able to go into the woods, whether it be hitting cans, um, whether you get yourself a permission, have a bit of a mooch. Um, you know, there's also the negative side of it, which we don't always like to talk talk about because we are in each hobby and for the most part not a clue about us you know let's be honest if, if we were to try to talk to somebody that doesn't really have an interest i've tried doing it and they're just not interested you know i could show them a couple oh look how nice this is they're not really bothered you know look how good this shot is i don't care yeah. um, but as soon as something bad um people are made very aware um yeah. and it's just the way we are as humans you know we, we hear about some more negative um you know, or something that causes somebody a bit of distress. And unfortunately, um, you know, it, it pokes a hole in somebody and, you know, they want to talk about it. So no matter how much good we do as a community, it doesn't really get talked about. But, you know, let, let, let's just talk about some of the things we've seen recently. Um, you know, and, and I know this is something you feel strongly about as well is yeah. 
you know, we, we've seen a lot of sort of bad things in the press. Um, you know, I've seen things of nursery windows getting put through bulb bearings. Yeah. Um, I'm originally from Cardiff, and I've seen a place in Cardiff where people were driving around, putting people's windows through. Um, you know, and then we're seeing things like swans and things like that getting um, killed, yeah. which happened recently in Edinburgh. Um, and it really gets to me because I feel like for the most part, I'd probably say 99% of the community are on the same page and we want our freedom to shoot, to be able to have this hobby that we all love um, and you, you know, do it in the right way. Mm. But they're always gonna, there's always going to be these people out there that are going to use it the wrong way. And unfortunately, yeah. it's going to end up affecting us all. Yeah, that's that is the worrying thing. It's you know eventually will it get to the point where they just go blanket ban? You know it's it's in the same subject. You know it's, it's in the same category as a knuckle duster or a kosh. You know anyone with a fork with a set of elastics tied to it, it is now a weapon rather than just you know. Because at the moment, obviously legally, it's just you just have to be eighteen and be sensible with it. There's no 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 power limits. There's no categories it is in at the moment. It's just you know don't be caught with it in the middle of a shop centre. Or you know, don't be, don't be an idiot with it. Pretty much, um, yeah. Because I'm in, I'm based in Surrey. I've, we've got Windsor just down the road. There's regular reports of people just walking up to the like the, the the ducks and the swans and stuff are there as tame as anything. They they feed out your hand. You know, you've got youngsters going down there and just shooting them with marbles, and it's it's just heartbreaking. You just think, oh, you know, if you've got interest in it, you know, come along to a competition. You know, there's there's come on, have a go. You know, if you're, if you're a pretty good shot, why you do that, then, you know, just come along, get involved that way. You know, if, if, if you say I'm, I'm more than happy, you know, people have got their permission or, you know, they've, they've got somewhere they can go and they think, you know, if you take one for the pot, if you're taking small ground game and it's your intention to take it home and eat it, absolutely fine with that. You know, it's when it's going out for when killing for killing's sake, that's when it's really going to affect, you know, us as a sport and the fact that it's just wrong in general. So uh, everyone, everyone's messed around when they were younger, but you know, it's, it's getting to the point where they're so it, it's they're so accessible, it's, it could end up causing damage, you know. And for the, for the longevity of the sport for us that are out there, you know, that, that will go out occasionally, you know, and do a bit of hunting, or us that want to go to a competition, you know, shoot in a safe, controlled environment with a catapult. It's you don't want to end up having to the point where you've got to take them around in a gun case and have a license to have a catapult, you know, or you know, you've got to be a, like a regular member of, say, like an archery club, you know, to have these in your possession when you're out and about. So that is the beautiful thing of it. And I've always referenced catapults as a back pocket sport. You know, one one pocket can have 300 ball bearings in it, the other one's got a catapult and a set of bands in it. And you can be out for hours, you know, whether you just want to go out and get a breather from stress at work. Well, you know, you want to go camping. You've got you've got the ability to do so, and you've got a short range shooting sport in the palm of your hand. It's amazing how accessible they are, but it's almost their downfall at the same time. It's, it's getting to the point where it is awful, and I really, really need to be able to sort of say, with the small platform I've got, you know, start pushing the message of, you know, please just don't be an idiot with them. You know, they're there, they're, they are potentially lethal, and they're saying in the wrong hands. Um, there's plenty of there's, there's loads of small charities set up around there that are pleading for help against you know they're, they're finding well in Sandhurst near me there's a the Swan Rescuer and it's it's heartbreaking seeing you know all these posts yeah oh, thank you very much someone saved a swan but it's like also last week like three more hens were shot and left floating around in the middle of a lake why you know mm -hmm. if it was your intention to take them home and eat them or you know whatever. You know, take a dog, take a trained dog to retrieve them for you. And why, but then why do it in a public area? You know, things like that, it's, it's so de detrimental to the sport and just to humans in general. It's just, you don't want to end up, you know, any anyone that's out there that's using them sensibly, you don't want to get tired of the same brush as, you know, oh, catapults, oh, they're, they're just, for, just for, for murdering things. They're really not. You know, I've, I've been lucky enough to, meet friends and our family through something as simple as a catapult so i met my friend patrick seven years ago and now i'm his boy's godfather you know and if i would not have met him and his family if it wasn't for just going to a competition and shooting catapults that I, that's a blessing i will forever be you know thankful of but then it's just i say people just look at it and go oh it is a catapult and you can just go cause damage with it for fun 
it's just complete two different ends of the stick and people just just trying to push the the better side of things up which would, would be absolutely amazing you know tell them about the world cups you know tell them about the competitions you know take a tin can out the wooden shoot if you want to put a hole in something and i think you know what what do you think we can do um you know as a community because one thing for me is is it got to, you know these youngsters are the next generation of shooters um and you know it is nice to see that you know when we're on social media and things like that i've seen you know i've seen these youngsters post a video and they're shooting something but then right behind what they're shooting is a house and they yeah. will get called out on this stuff and you know and I, and I enjoy seeing that you know um as always on social media you'll get a couple of keyboard warriors who think it's funny and stuff like that but for the most part yeah when i see people kind of interact and say look you can't be doing that it, that's what makes me feel like we're still in control a little bit you know yeah. Yeah. We, we still have this really strong group of people who want to keep this alive yeah and, and, and you yeah, know that, as that, you mentioned that's the beautiful thing about it you've got these people that will you know it's they might get labeled a, a keyboard warrior and you know, saying, oh lads why are you shooting that or you know watch out for the houses behind but you know that's what we need you know people to say oh, hang on yeah that was a good shot but if it missed you know mrs jones eight doors down has just lost a roof tile you know or you know it's gone through a greenhouse it's for things like that you it's, you almost need to go to an archery club or an air rifle club as a youngster and realize you know like what you're shooting at can be easily destroyed you know it's what if you don't ever point a loaded gun at something that you don't intend to destroy or well, same exactly the same with the catapult you know you're shooting a bull bear in it 280 feet per second you know it's, it's not just going to give something a love bite you know if it hits someone or something it's going to be it's hurting yeah so it's things like that it's it's almost need a little like a it is just taking on board you know someone going well you know next time just just watch your backs off and it's just having the individual to go yeah that's a fair point you know if that was my house behind i would be pretty gutted rather than you know just having a go oh you know leave me alone i'll do what i want it's that attitude that will be really detrimental but hopefully people, you know, so people learn different ways but hopefully that's one way that you know as long as people can politely call each other up because you know the internet is a wonderful world for the safety behind a screen so people can you know f and blind you know call you this that and the other but you know it's just if you talk to someone normally they normally listen you know like you rather than say i oh, you're an idiot what you're doing compared to well hang on mate you know just you might just want to do this next time you know it's just taking that on board so i think that is a brilliant way of like localizing it that's directly doing it but yeah it's, it's a good question I, what we can do as a community is a it's a challenge but you know it's, it's whether it's, yeah that's one thing that really goes through my mind most days you know what can i do to keep pushing the better side of catapults rather than just going you know, just go to competitions because you know people will go out and hunt you know they've got freedom to do so and you know, say like fair play to them but, you know it's just it's doing it sensibly you know and just not doing things like shooting glass bottles in kids parks <laughs> and i think so, you know we can always turn we always have an opportunity to turn a negative into a positive um yeah. you know my background kind of growing up i was in the mixed martial arts scene and the amount of young lads that I seen come off the streets um, that were getting themselves into trouble ended up turning them lo their lives around from just being yeah. able to lose a bit of steam and use that energy in the gym. You know, it could be as simple as doing that with slingshots. As you mentioned, going to competitions. If you're a great shot and you're doing well in these competitions, you're going to want to go back. And you, then you're also going to be involved with the right people. You're going to be involved in people who are going to say, look, mate, you can't be doing that. You know, they might share some stories. Say, oh, I did this. I went down. And I shot this swan. Someone's then going to turn and go, "Why? What do you think? Like, don't don't yeah. do that." And, and and say exactly the same things that we just said today. So I think you know, the more we can get these people involved in competitions um, and things like that, I think that might help. That might be one way to do it. But um, you know, the problem is they are readily available, um, yeah. and yeah. unfortunately, it is an opportunity for someone to kind of take advantage of that. But you know, as we said, there's always opportunities to turn negatives into positives. Um, and, you know, my hopes are that as a community, we can stand, stand strong, um, yeah. you know, and, and keep it as um, sensible as we can, really. Yeah, yeah. I, I totally agree as well. With a, so with a mixed martial arts background like yourself, so I've done a bit over the years and 
things with uh, things like army cadets as well. I've, I've done five and a half years in the army cadets. Yeah. I, again, I've seen people come in. You know, you know, are they known to be you know, a terror at school? You know, they they've, they've, might have a criminal record, or whatever. But they come in. You know, they're this. Oh, I don't care attitude. You know, a little bit of discipline, and then especially say with the army cadets, it's like here's a firearm and here's instructions how to shoot it. It centers anyone. You know, you you put this, especially when they do it well as well. All of a sudden, they've gone, "Wow, I'm pretty good at this." You know, I've I've taken a two two and I can put five leaf clover at twenty five meters, or I can take a, you know, an L eighty five and put five rounds into an aluminium plate at two hundred yards. All of a sudden, it's focused, and then they just start to relay that that further down the line. Whether it is just catapults, you the understanding behind that. Same again, same with the martial arts. You, know, you once you understand what punch can do to someone that's when you think well you know like this is dangerous and this can really hurt someone so you know there's no you know just throwing it around willy-nilly the same with the catapults yeah they're they, you know they're the stereotypical dentist the menace not the toy but mm -hmm. again with modern elastics and a steel ball bearing they can do serious damage so it's once that real like, realization sets in with the right mindset behind it that's normally when people start to sort of take note and think yes this is for me or no it's not so yeah brilliant well i suppose we better go on with these questions because uh like i said it's a bit of a list there um and i'm ex I'm, I'm actually really excited to ask them because uh thank you chris <laughs> this, is it, this is your hall of fame moment um right so the first one we got is from uh jesus g ramirez so he wants to know who is your favorite builder uh and why and when did you have your last four kit um and can i have that slingshot with a four kit <laughs> <laughs> oh right, uh, favorite builder there is a lot again there's a lot with different different aspects but i think one of my all-time favorites was paul cheatham he just doesn't i don't think he makes anymore if he does it's very quiet about it he was an incredibly centered guy who made an absolutely blinding frame i've never seen such a good hand finish with such basic tools um and my last fork okay. probably four years ago i think it was by the micro raptor and for whatever reason i shot across my body like this whilst walking to try and shoot a dead tree and yeah it obviously shooting cross body like that it just dinked on it was so light that's the only thing it was so light but still we've done enough damage to put a lovely little crater just in the fork tip but yeah i've uh, i got i won't be giving that one away uh i've sanded it out <laughs> <laughs> so the next one's from james clarkson who's uh he's actually from my ways uh he wants to know do you use your forefinger to assist in aiming as i've noticed it covers your aiming point on the fork Oh, so yeah, I had the pleasure to shoot with James at uh, Harrogate a couple of weekends ago. Really nice guy. Um, well, I'll show you. Because I, as I said earlier, I hold almost too high from a side view. There we go. I'm holding the tips as as high up as they can go. But normally in the full draw, my hand is like that. I don't necessarily use the forefinger. Well, the, my, my index finger, sorry. It's just... As where the bands are drawn back, my line of sight is somewhere just under the tip. The index finger almost just disappears at the end of a shotgun. It just goes into my peripherals, and that's it's it's just all. If obviously if I could, I'd tuck it away, but I just find a lot more relaxed hold when I can grip it up that way with an open hand rather than trying to pinch it up. There's a lot less strain involved. So any strain just comes through that top knuckle all the way down the wrist. So I hope that answers that one. And you've never ne never smashed your finger doing that? <laughs> nope. I get I do have a lot of people say like you almost can't see the fork tips. Like how would you not hit your hand? But it's just, you know, when you've shot enough ball bearings, you know, like it's just it's just naturally it, the flick every time just gets the bands clean out of the way. Yeah, so yeah. Perfect. Touch wood, no hand hits. I um, just want to give out uh, a shout out to Kyle Camastra, who says, best of the best, John Jeffries. So I just thought yeah, I'd add that in there. Um, Sean Shag Hackleton 
Uh, if you could use one slingshot for the rest of your life, what would it be and why? That one. Same again. It's just that's almost like the final form. I think I've, I've made myself about four Mustangs now. But yeah, that's that's the one I'm I'm set on. It does absolutely everything for me. Uh, the, the fit, the finish, everything is that's that's my sort of final piece. So yeah, if I had to give all the others away and just keep that one, that would be my one. 85 mil, 85 millimeters wide, 23 mil tips, and I think it's 105 millimeters long. Perfect. There we go, Sean. So Tim Henry, um, which I know fairly well, um, he wants to know what tools do you use and how long do you spend on a frame? He also wants to know why us dirty UK guys call them catapults. <laughs> I get that a lot of the catapults and slingshot conversation. It's technically a catapult is the trebuchet sort of type design, but I think it's just stuck over time with the name catapult. It seems a very, yeah, very American thing to call it slingshot, very English thing to call it a catapult. Um, yeah, I don't really know why the difference there is. Uh, as for tooling, what have I got? Pillar drill, bench grinder, uh, bench sander, and a bobbin sander. The rest of it's just done with chainsaw files, rasps, and then yeah, bobbin sand to shape, and then everything from 120 grit to 3000 grit is done by hand. So yeah, it, these are my other machine. <laughs> and how long does that take you to make a frame? Uh, simple, like I say, like a five layer laminate. You're looking at like a day all in. Like, but that's like, that's a long day, you know. I'm seven till seven, and that's <laughs> over. mistake. It's not a couple of hours. Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a long day, you know. And that's not including you, you glue in time, you know, all all the final bits like that is. But yeah, that hope. Normally, I try to build in a little bit of a batch system, you know. Whilst one's getting cut out, another one's gluing, and whilst I'm shaping another one, the next one's ready to go in. So it's not a production line, but it's just like a, it just narrows it down. So you know, I can go straight onto a dry build. Once it's once that's been glued, whilst another one's gluing, it just cuts time down like that. But yeah, say for a, for, a, for a simple, you know, say an apex with no more carving it, obviously with a hoof on the Mustang, that takes another sort of forty minutes to do. But yeah, it's um, it's a, a a long day if I'm pushing for one. Okay, there we go. Um, Chuck in steel, he wants to know um, what was your very first frame build, and do you still have it to this day? uh very first no i know where it is though my friend andreas bought it off me it was just a basic ash fork with a little mahogany end cap i, I stuck on it and lacquered it to death yeah he's still got that now so yeah it's, it's not gone too far at least you know where it is at least you know where it still is i guess um so andy mont um who he runs the uh grizzly um slingshot tournament actually and he was speaking the other day about having kids involved in the competition um i just thought i'd touch on that as we were speaking about grassroots yeah. great idea from him um why don't you build a clipped apex or mustang and are you planning on it that's a question i get asked a lot as well to be fair um if i was to start using clips on a frame i would probably make a new design uh the way my catapults are designed to be held incorporating tips that i'd have to, have to change the tip shape or you know add thickness to places where i wouldn't want to um but mainly it's because i just i'm a bit old school you know with, with more working parts there's more chance of something going wrong i you know i'm a stickler for it. i've been out before you know if you if you're at all relies on something else you know whether it be an angle grinder and you've lost your your blade change like the tool or you know you've gone out and you you don't have an allen key to tighten up your you your locking blade or anything like that it just it really grinds my gears you know you've got to rely on something else at least with wrap and tuck you know if i've got to change bands i can just pull the same wrap off put a new set of bands on and put them back on i'm not relying on an allen key and i've seen a few builds over time uh cheltenham was probably one of the last ones i saw i was scoring for a young lad as he's drawn back to the target like that is just as he's aiming, I can just see the bands just walking out of the tips. And it was just like, I was like, don't, don't let that ball bearing go. I said, your bands are moving. All right, put them back on, tighten them in. Again, start walking out and it really threw them out. 
it was either you know rush a shot or you know just or just don't shoot and is it really messed up his shooting it's obviously uh, you, you can change the cups you can change the actual rib nuts over time but i don't I just again it's, it's more working parts if you know if it does go wrong at the at the, at the wrong time you know you, you're camping and that's your only catapult you know I, oh, I don't have a spare set of rib nuts it's just a wrap and tuck's never failed me and i like to sell and produce products you know that work for me because that's that's how i sort of started doing it you know I, I made the mustang for myself and all of a sudden people go yeah that also works for me so i have sort of stuck to that maybe one day with clamps you know but it's it's not something i'd like to adapt my mustang or apex to not not yet anyway Makes complete sense. No, you put it that way. It makes complete sense. Um, <laughs> Kerry Sandlin, um, if you were in a tournament and you weren't allowed to use your own frames, what would you use? Ooh. Um, a Toad by Lewis Pride. Very small, compact little frame. I had one and that was my backup for years. Of, well, yeah, because I'd only made myself one Mustang and I've I would never be able to wrap and tuck, especially for the well for the indoor events. You normally got three minutes for your uh, was it two and a half or three minutes for five shots. So if you got a band break, there's no chance you're going to wrap and tuck a new or even with clamps, you're not going to be able to wrap and tuck or clamp up a new set of bands. So yeah, I used a Lewis Pride Toad as my backup for years, and yeah, absolutely love them. That would probably be my go-to. Perfect. Uh, Nate Amore, um, he wants to know where you source your materials. All over the world. But material, stuff like material, like the G10, Mercatus, mainly America. Uh, Mammoth Ivory and stuff, they bit more exotic stuff. That comes from Siberia, the North Sea, Russia. Um, I get some of my G10s from sort of Europe, if I can get it, if they've got it in stock. But yeah. Any of my custom stuff, all the um, the resins, any like the especially for Nate's, he's got a couple of really nice builds from me with uh, Tweed Macarta. I get that made in the UK by Danny Sherwood. There, um, yeah, that's it's all over really. I've got a few few bits and pieces through Emberleaf for uh, workshops, bladesmiths. I do when we, we do collaborations, so they've got access to a like plethora of different materials. We normally adapt the material to work for a catapult as well as a knife. Yeah, all over. Perfect. Um, Ian Jones, and I have no idea what this means, but I'm sure you'll explain. Do you still wear your lucky pants? <laughs> I don't. <laughs> this come up in uh, Italy last time we were out there. My mate Billy put a, uh, put a comment on his post saying, has John got his lucky pants on? And it sort of went from there. Every time I see Ian, he's always asking, do I have them on? <laughs> I don't actually have a lucky set of pants, but yeah, they're... I always say I'm disappointed that. now. I was wondering what these pants were. <laughs> oh, look at these. <laughs> <laughs> Just make it up and sell them, mate. I'm sure you'll sell a couple. <laughs> JJCC pants. <laughs> <laughs> Custom pants by JJ. Perfect. Um, next one is by Dan Layton, who I've had on the podcast. Shout out to Dan Layton. Uh, how long does a custom frame take you? And are they all done by hand? Which I know you've answered, but is there anything else you want to touch on with that one? Uh, yeah, everything is totally made by hand. Um, so we're all cut from sheet material, layered, glued, pinned, sculpted, hand sanded, that everything down to the packaging, even the labels written out by hand. Yeah, there's a, there's no heavy machining, there's no CNC work. I get a lot of people to say, especially new people to it, go, oh, are they are they poured or are they hydro dipped? Do you have like a model that you just colour in? But no, everything is all, all normally a flat sheet that's layered and uh, laminated together and sculpted from there. Yeah, same again with it with, with the custom work. Time depends on complexity. So yeah, like five layer laminate is a very long day. Where other builds like mammoth ivory, it's something I'd have to go back to over weeks and weeks and weeks because it's such a with a. It can be temperamental, but what well, it's it's twenty thousand to. 80,000 years old, you know, it's been in the ground a long time. It's stabilized, but you know, it still does have to normalize once it's been cut down into a smaller piece. It's one thing I will have to keep going back over and refinishing. So, yeah, that's builds it up. They just extend into days of work. Got you. Perfect. Um, so, this one's by Stu, who I'm in contact with on Instagram. Uh, he, uh, what advice would you give to a young maker who's starting his journey in making catties? 
invest in materials. Uh, Dean at Emberleaf told me that, you know, invest in yourself. That's the best. Don't, don't cut corners, you know, buy, buy the best materials you can. Um, and just, you know, don't, and patience. Patience is one thing you can't buy, but yeah, it's just, you know, a lot of people hate making because it's the whole, oh, I don't like hand sanding. Until you say there's a machine that will hand sand for us, it's, you know, that's one thing that will have to be done. But yeah, just invest in yourself when it comes to making something new. And um, especially when it comes down to stuff like designs, just be inspired, but don't copy. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Uh, so this one's by Soam Shot Um Check him out on YouTube. Um, what's your mental state in the international or any tournament? That's a good one. I always say to myself, you know, just it's just another day on the catch box down the side of the workshop. You know, ignore everything else that's going on. Granted, that's hard, but yeah, I just, you know, just try and zone out and just have a good fun. Luckily, with the indoor ones, it's very rare that you'll be on your own. Like I say, because I'm, it works because I'm right hand, I'm left eye dominant on right hand hold. So I'm normally facing everyone else that's left hand hold. So I've always got to uh, just look up and there'll be a team member or a mate, you know, there's no, there's pressure, but you know, you're like, oh, sweet, I'm just with the boys just shooting some discs. Yeah, just trying to, like, if, that's what I say to everyone, just treat it like another day on the catch box down the alleyway. There you go. Perfect. Uh, Taylor Mate, um, you had a bunch of questions, um, all tied into one. Um, so for those starting to build, what tools would you say are must haves? Do you have a favorite brand of tools? Um, and do you have a favorite tool? Um, what tools would you recommend getting first to make the job easier? Um, I'd say a pillar drill is probably the best. You can do so much from a pillar drill. You can drill, you can get sand in sleeves that go straight into the same chuck. I would, yes, a pillar drill getting a perfectly tight fit 90 degree hole through materials makes a massive difference to finish and fit. Um, adapting the tools that can go on a pillar drill. I'd say that would be probably one of the most important tools to start to start off with, I would say. Obviously, you need things like a scroll saw or a band saw. Then it's just, you know, it's just endless with different blades and different bits you can add to it. But yeah, something like a scroll saw, a band saw and a pillar drill would all you really would need to start off with. And then, yeah, it just sort of expands slowly from there. So I haven't got a high end uh, workshop. You know, so I just A lot of my tools are just hobbyist tools, mainly Sherpak. They're always quite good. I like to stick to one brand. Yeah, it's a pillar drill and good quality blades or drill bits don't don't scrimp on drill bits because a lot of the time you'll buy a multi-pack of 100 for a fiver but they're made out of chocolate so <laughs> yeah i've actually tried, i've been drilling materials before and the drill bit will just unwind you end up with just a straight rod <laughs> so can it grips it's uh it's or you know you try drill something like wood or anything harder than that and it will just blow out it's just yeah it, invest in the right tools you know they and they'll, they'll always help you out there we go. Perfect. Uh, Brian McGregor, um, we've already answered this, so uh, I'll just shout him out, but he was going to ask about um, whether you're going to make clipped frames. Um, but obviously, we have touched on that. We've got a great answer from you for that. Um, Zach Slingshots, um, how long were you building before you re you were really satisfied with your frames? And what point did you decide to sell them? Am I, am I ever really satisfied? <laughs> Every time I finish a one, I think, you know, like, oh, is it perfect? Like, oh, I don't, have I done enough on it? I'm, you know, I'm never, it's very rare that I'll finish a build and I think, you know, I'm 100%. There, there's, there's, no, there's probably nothing wrong with them, but, you know, it's just me being the actual maker. I'm like, oh, is there anything I could have done? You know, is there anything more I could have done to make it better for the customer? Um, well, as for when did I start making properly? It was probably after the World Cup. One of my first actual customers was um, Nathan Masters from Simple Shop. I was sat sharing a beer in the in the town in uh, Guado Tadino, and yeah, just you know, everyone was just pass around catapults. Oh, what are you shooting? What are you shooting? And then Nathan just said, you know, I really like this. Let me know a price as and when. And I thought, you know what, well, this is really cool. You know, the biggest producer of slingshots in America has just complimented my work. You know, I thought, wow, there must be something here. So yeah, probably about 2018, it ramped up. Then shortly after coming home, uh, I'm a gas engineer, a plumber, 
uh, plumbing and heating engineer by trade. Um, and that was really drying up for me because I'm really OCD when it comes to fit and finish. And there's too much, you know, just, just get it in and go home. I hated that attitude. Uh, luckily enough to go over to Unbelief Workshops and say, like, oh, do you sell any materials? Like, I make catapults like this. Showed Dean and Joel there. And they went, oh, these are really cool. And I like these. You know, we could do something here. You know, like you've got a really cool sort of, you know, the whole thing is just, you know, a really good package. Everything, the fit and finish, for what you do for the basic materials you've got. Um, really like it. And then, again, that was just another sort of, like, so a little, a bit of a bit of an uplift, like oh wow, like you know, professional bladesmiths are just complimenting my work, and then so we started doing our collaborations. Uh, there loads of little different aspects what sort of started, so I sort of started off that, and yeah, just the customers coming in saying I want one. That that made a massive difference to how easy it was to say right, I'm going to start, you know, sourcing more materials, actually stocking materials rather than just ordering material for a specific build. Yeah, so. So did you actually go out and decide that you were going to make them and sell them? Or was that never really your plan at the beginning? Oh, no, never. I Never in a million years would I thought I would just start making and selling. It was only, it got to the point where I was doing sort of 10 hours on site and I was coming home in my evenings and my wind down was catapult making, you know, stick the radio on, sit there sanding a bronze Milbro core chilling out a bit of buffalo horn on the go cup of tea and then so that was my that really was my time to sort of chill out and then you know people go oh really cool yeah i'll put an order in you know as and when and it was i was it was just topping up and it got to the point where i was i was genuinely busier in my evenings than i was during my day and when i was getting compliments from customers like this is incredible or, oh, i absolutely love it it's absolutely perfect or you know anything like that any little compliment and i was going back to work and going you know, oh, I don't care what it looks like, just get it in. That I was like, I just hate this attitude. I, Two I just, very I just, different things. Yeah, and it, eventually it fizzled out. Obviously, I still do. I, I'm still a plumber. I still do bits and pieces, but, you know, I put my sort of heart and soul into create, creating things. I say even down to lanyard beads, beads with worry stones. or started to do a bit of cast jewellery as well. If there's anything I can uh, have a go at, I'd absolutely love to do so. There we go. Perfect. Um so Kevin William Lowe, um, what tip do you know now that you wish you knew when you first started making? Uh, that's a good question. That's what, that stumped me that one. Um, wet sanding. At first, I thought, oh, you know, just it's just sandpaper, and it just carry on as usual. Obviously, with my Carter and G10, I had a fan on to get rid of the, like, the awful dust that comes off of it. Luckily, soon enough, I was like, oh, yeah, you can just submerge it in water, and it just makes your whole life so much easier <laughs> and safer, you know, because you don't want to be breathing that stuff in. But, yeah, wet sanding was the biggest thing. Yeah, I started off just dry sanding, but, yeah, yeah, wet sanding for sure. There we go. Perfect. So just before we finish off, um, I want to just – Give the mic to you and just is there anything that you want to touch on or what message do you want to leave listeners just before we uh, finish up here um well i think just sort of going back to what we said earlier you know just inspire more people with what good catapults can do you know they can bring people together you, know, you can travel all around the world with something as simple as a slingshot you know get as many people into this as possible you know the right mindsets will absolutely just ramp it up it would be lovely to see it as a as an open sport, you know, where people regularly go, you know, have, have enough funding and enough driven people to open up local clubs, you know, indoor or outdoor clubs would be absolutely amazing. Um, so yeah, just the catapult community is an amazing place to be. I absolutely, I thank every day I wake up and I'm still part of the community. You know, every day I can log on and I've got messages from all over the world from friends that you know I regularly speak to, like it's just everywhere. And it, it's just, uh, it's incredible how, so, so something as simple as a bit of carbon fiber and some elastic or a bit of wood and a bit of leather can bring so much together. It's, it's, it's incredible. And it's a sport that we should all, you know, push for the sensible side of it, push for the practical side of it. And hopefully it's safe for the next couple of generations, catapults are still around, catapults are still absolutely fine to own and use. You know, pushing it in the right direction will only make this sport just grow and grow. There's a lot of 
amazing people out there. You know, there's a lot of people out there, larger companies like Wasp Slingshots. They sponsor count, countless events, you know, and they get, they provide such an entry level uh, line of builds. It's you for like less than twenty quid, you can get into the sport, and it's I say people should play on the back of that, you know, like get into it. It's a sh- it's a short range shooting sport. There's, there's there's something primal in all of us, you know. If you can put, put a cat on the floor and you can hit it with a catapult, I don't care who you are, what walk of life you're from, there you'll always make you smile. And mm-hmm. it's amazing. It's, it's even down to the point, you know, as simple as like someone goes, here's a rock, chuck it at that dustbin, and you hit that dustbin, you go, God, what a shot. You've achieved nothing. Realistically, you've achieved nothing, but it's just it's something there. And especially when you know you can go, Oh, yeah, I've got this catapult and I can I can yeah, you know, I can achieve like accuracy that you know an air rifle shooter would struggle to match stood upright. And it is it's incredible. So yeah, hopefully the catapult community just keeps growing as it does internationally and internally it's just yeah it's bringing so many people together and it's one thing we really should uh cherish rather than you know we don't want to see too many bad sides of it i couldn't have said any better to be honest with you um let's just quickly add um i'll put a little in the description below um, I'll let everyone know how they can contact you or get hold of some of your amazing builds. Um, but just l- let everyone know where they can reach you. Awesome. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, Instagram, uh, Facebook on my business page or so, or, or privately. So I'm personally on all the groups. So I do have John Jeffries Custom Catapults as a Facebook group and John Jeffries Custom Creations on Instagram. Um, or through Etsy, I've got an Etsy store as well, JJCC Shop. That's why I like to keep some of my stock. Yeah, I'm accessible on loads of different platforms. Um, yeah, drop me a message anytime. So I'm, I'm always on my phone. <laughs> so yeah, it's a, 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 any different platform, I'm always there. Perfect. Thank you very much for coming on. Um, I've really enjoyed that chat and I've actually learned a lot about building and I don't see myself getting into a workshop and doing any of it soon. It seems way too up there for me, but um, absolutely love your work. I'm sure I'll get my hands on one of your frames uh, soon enough. Um, But again, just thank you for coming on. Um, Hope you've all enjoyed it and uh, I'll see you soon. Thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you. It's been absolutely brilliant. I hope you've enjoyed today's episode. If you have done, please like and subscribe to the channel and get involved. Send your questions in whenever i got guests coming on. I really enjoy asking your questions and the guests seem to get a bit of a buzz from it too. Until then, happy shooting and I'll catch you next time.